Um, if your phone is not silenced, please do that. Turn it on. Do not disturb. That's meant for fun to be called out, kind of. Keep your phone going out. And let me double check that I didn't forget anything. Uh, yeah, I think that's about it. So we hope you enjoy our presentation. And thank you again for coming. Netflix's original show, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story, has been the new craze ever since its release date in September of 2022. True crime has always been a point of fascination, but the intrigue is starting to spread to kids my age. However, the allure is encroaching on dangerous territory. Many individuals have claimed that they feel empathetic towards Dahmer, and have spoken of their fascination with him on TikTok and other forms of social media. This is an example of how the media can alter the identity of an awful person like Jeffrey Dahmer. And Dahmer receives empathy he does not deserve as a result. A person who has committed such heinous crimes as Dahmer should not be jilted by media representation or admired by mainstream watchers. These portrayals of monsters should not be viewed as entertainment, let alone created in the first place. No serial killer should be sensationalized in any form of media. First, We'll identify our fascination with serial killers. Secondly, we'll expose how mass murderers are sensationalized. And finally, we will sentence the public to learn how we can better honor the families of victims. Let's learn from Megan Long that so many in our society have disregarded for years. First, let's address our fascination with serial killers. Whether we want to admit it or not, serial killers are interesting. It's in our human nature to be curious about what makes a murderer tick. A May 2022 Psychology Today article explains that humans observe serial killers similarly to how prey observe their predators. It's extremely useful for prey to be able to safely observe their predators and learn more about them. It allows them to know when their predator is hungry or when it's not safe to be anywhere near them. Likewise, humans use media content of serial killers to learn how to safely avoid them. Humans also study mass murderers as a way to release strong emotions or excitement. This is also known as catharsis. Being immersed in a group story puts us on the edge of our seats and we're drawn to know more. In a 2019 article, Su Young Lee, a professor of sociology at the University of Toronto, explains that seeing a car crash on the side of the road is a good example of how we're drawn to horrible events. We have a desire to know more about what happened, even though we know the result was most likely a tragedy. We are also instilled with an intense desire to understand why these people do the things that they do. We delve into the trauma that these serial murderers experience throughout their lives. Knowing more about their past helps us justify their actions, as stated by a 2022 Discover Magazine article. There is a growing obsession in our culture about these serial killers. Some will stop at nothing to solve the puzzle that is a serial killer's mind and uncover the motive behind their horrendous acts. The entire truth industry is growing at an alarming rate. Now, let's discover how serial killers are sensationalized. It's not a shameful thing to merely be curious about these individuals. However, media influence can cause general viewers to take this curiosity to an extreme level. In this day and age, media and technology are a part of our daily lives. They influence us so much we don't even realize it. Research conducted and documented by the National Library of Medicine and the National Institute of Health in May of 2020 proved that watching a movie can influence how we view different aspects of our lives. That being said, serial killers are all over American media, so much so we might not even realize them are referenced. There are multiple song lyrics, movies, and TV shows at our disposal. Recently, Katy Perry has been under fire for the phrase, eat your heart out, like Jeffrey Dahmer in her song, Dark Horse. Real serial killers can even inspire fictional ones. For instance, Ed Gein was the inspiration for the killer Buffalo Bill in the movie The Silence of the Lambs. A December 2020 Psychology Today article 
which claims that the media does not draw the line between fiction and fact regarding these murders. An example of this can be seen on the platform used by the billions of people every day, TikTok. One user who had watched the new Netflix series regarding Jeffrey Dahmer came to the conclusion that people are homophobic if they think Jeffrey Dahmer was a bad person. This clearly in no way, shape, or form is accurate. Jeffrey Dahmer was an awful and vile person. The fact that he endured struggles throughout his life does not justify his actions. This user has made several videos idolizing Jeffrey Dahmer, and even went to the extent to build a shrine to him. Our society needs to be able to recognize that we can't empathize with these people. Serial killings need to be taken seriously, and it should not be acceptable to defend or idolize them. Betraying them in the media minimizes how sick and twisted their actions were. We cannot give these people glamorization or empathy. They have done nothing to earn it, and they have done everything to lose it. Now, let's sentence the public learn how we can better honor the families of victims. We must consider how serial killing being in the media affects the families of the victims. They should without a doubt be informed when there is a new movie, TV series, or documentary being created. Unfortunately, many of the families of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims are not aware of the new Dahmer series which is being streamed on Netflix. Rita Isbell, the sister of the Dahmer victim, Errol Lindsay, disclosed that she was never contacted regarding the show, and no one had asked her for her opinion on whether or not the show should be produced in an October 2022 New York Times article. The families of these victims should not be an afterthought. They experienced these tragedies firsthand, and they lost someone that they loved to perish. Despite this, the entertainment industry still continues to profit off of the widespread interest in serial killers. Total ad revenue of True Crime Podcast in 2018 was $487 million. These producers profit off of forcing families to relive the worst moments of their lives by delving into the horrifying details of these cases. Rita Isbell also reveals that the show brought back the trauma she felt during Jeffrey Dahmer's trial. These tragedies are not something to make a profit on. They are very real events that happened and they are still affecting people today. We need to find a solution to ensure that no serial killer gets to save some lives. The answer lies in our entertainment priorities. Shifting the narrative to that of victims' families ensures that they won't be resubjected to the glorification of their trauma. If you really need your true crime fix, consider switching on a documentary that puts the focus on honoring victims. The Keepers on Netflix addresses the murder of sister Kathy Fenzik through the eyes of her students rather than through the perspective of her murderer. Night Stalker, the hunt for a serial killer, centers on the investigation process rather than the murderer himself. I Survived is a surprisingly inspiring show on Hulu in which victims retell their stories, thus tackling their trauma and reclaiming what happened to them. There are a plethora of shows to watch that do not glorify serial killers to leave the sensationalized dramatizations behind. We cannot indulge the widespread curiosity we have about serial killers. It's wrong to do so and only gives these murderers fame and empathy. This solution would ensure that serial killers do not get the attention that they do not deserve while putting the victims and their families first. Our society has normalized seeing serial killers on the big screen. This issue boils down to more than a guilty pleasure for many individuals and it needs to be brought to an end. No serial killer should be sensationalized. First, we identified or vaccination with serial killers. Secondly, we exposed how mass murderers are sensationalized. And finally, we sentenced the public to learn how we can better honor the families of victims. Serial killers do not deserve any attention, and they should not be in the media. Regardless of what hardship a person has experienced, there is no excuse for brutally taking several people lives. Portraying them in the media causes people across the world to empathize with the person who has lost any chance at deserving our sympathy. These adaptations also force families to relive the horror of losing someone that they loved. It's in our human nature to be curious about these atrocious murderers, but it is not ethical to give them the fame that they have been given. So, 
that are tuning in to the latest limited series, Glorifying Violence and Crime, let's look to honor the lives of victims and not the lives of protests. Like most private eyes, I fight two battles. One against the bad guys, and the other against my waistline. <laughs> but I like it, especially since you never know what will happen next. Private eye Phyllis Harlow is down on her luck. The rent is due, no cases are coming in, and she's stuck in this dump with no TV reception but fortune start to turn when shifty piano tutor Alexander Stevens comes in with woman troubles, specifically that of his ex-fiancee Darlene Bourgeois, who is out for blood. With help from her right-hand lady and assistant Millie, and uh, honest with the nail file and gold mine for information, Ruth. Can she solve the case in time? In That Was No Lady, That Was a Private Detective by Dennis Sweet. Phil, it's DeMarco. He kidnapped the doctor, stole a whole bunch of pills. He's got a gun, and it looks bad for Lorraine. Millie, I already told you. If I wanted to know what was happening on General Hospital, I would watch General Hospital. But it was the two-hour special. Millie Barlow, my aide confidant, secretary, and a girl you could count on, unless she's watching the soaps. Anything else? On what show? On this show, Millie. Was there any calls, any mail? Oh, uh, let me think. No calls, no mail, nothing. Thanks. Oh, except for one call from Mrs. Black. She wants to know where the rent is. That makes two of us. I'll call her tomorrow. You know, Phil, we deserve a better office than this. It's dirty, drafty, disgusting, and the TV reception is terrible. I can hardly get channel six at all lately. Something will turn up. Oh, it already did. What's it? A client named Alexander Stevens. He's been here for half an hour. Mr. Stevens, Miss Harlow will see you now. Uh, Miss Harlow? Mr. Stevens? I need your help. What can I do for you? Well, it's my fiance, or should I say ex fiance? I broke up the engagement last week and she's been acting erratically ever since. Go on. Well, she comes from an extremely wealthy family and she's used to getting whatever she wants. Right now, that's me. I can understand why, Mr. Stevens. You're about to make a fool of something I ain't never seen you do. Now, tell me, what can I do for you? Well, I want you to follow her, find out what she's up to, and let me know. Mr. Stevens, is this ex-fiance of yours capable of violence? She's capable of anything. Anything? 
anything. And she finds the square root of pi, an equation where the x is unknown and the y is an imaginary number. It was her master's thesis. I guess there's no point in asking if she was a world-class pole vaulter. Bronze from Montreal, 76. I'm nervous, Miss Holo, and a man of my profession can't afford to be nervous. What do you do? I tune pianos. Important work. I know. Here's a picture of my ex-fiance. Her name is Darlene Dubois, daughter of millionaire Henry Dubois. How'd you get tied up with her? Well, I went to their mansion to tune their piano, and one thing led to another. Now I'm in a lot deeper than I ever dreamed. Mr. Stevie, we have a saying in this business. It goes, hell hath no fury like a dame who's done wrong. What does it mean? It means I canceled your case. I'm willing to pay you $10,000. <clears throat> like I said, it sounds right up my alley. <laughs> Good. I only need 48 hours. Why 48 hours? I'm headed to Rome to be the house tuner at the Vatican. She'll never catch me up there. Mr. Stevens, from now until you stay on that plane, I want you to stay out of sight. No walks in the park, no trips to the store, and especially no running for public office. Whatever you may say, Miss Harlow, here's a key to the locker at the airport containing $10,000. The money's yours as soon as the plane leaves with me on it. You mean it. On it is a tough way to fly. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Harlow. Good luck, Mr. Stevens. How did it go? He's got a problem of the female variety. That's the worst kind. Bring, bring. Harlow, I'll check it out. Where are you going, Phil? Just got a lead on the game he's after on Mr. Stevens. Gonna check it out. Reliable information is a must in this game. But if you can get your nails done while you're at it, all the better. Hi, yo, yo. Hi, <sighs> Phil. Ruth Romanowski, an artist with a nail file and a gold mine for information. What'll it be? You tell me. Well, I think you should use a buff and a little background on Darlene Boudoir. Go. Darlene's a strange egg, spoiled rotten. In the sixth grade, she lost the word, the spelling bee to the word tenseness. I've never heard of that word before. Yeah, after she lost it, Daddy paid to have it taken out of every dictionary in the world. Well, Dolly's all grown up now. She's got a license to carry a gun uh, and a thesaurus. She no. can hold a gun and she can hold a liquor. Ever since Mr. Piano Tuna broke off the engagement, she's been doing a lot of both. Ah, yeah, she not only wants this guy to regret breaking up with her, she wants to finish him professionally. By breaking his fingers? By making him tone deaf. She plans to lock him in his sound booth for 72 hours and make him listen to progressive punk rock. <laughs> for Bex. Thanks for the info. All right, Bex. Darlene's at the hot for Stevens. Stevens is headed for Rome. Add it all up, and you have this. Why didn't she go to the diamond store for the ring? When did she know that the fountain was missing? Who framed Roger Lover? Where's the money? And why do I finish every paragraph with a series of unrelated questions? What do you think, Millie? Millie? Millie asked me to take a message. <gasps> Darlene Bourgeois. Phil Harlow charmed, I'm sure. Where's Millie? She went out, like a lack. One more step and it would be your last, Miss Harlow. You've got about one minute left before you're taking an extended vacation in an exclusive little swamp. An improvement, I'd have to say. You wouldn't use that thing, wouldn't I? You see the stuff though on my shirt, Miss Harlow? Well, I've got a real one in my bag. A nasty, hungry little one. Really had to take a sneak up a few boys.
goes from not to be Walter P-38K, nine millimeter, and Art ejected hollow points through the screen, and I'm sure one of them has got your name on it. Yeah, but from what I hear, you probably didn't spell it right. <gasps> there, well, thank you. Well enough to know that what you're in now spells trouble. All right, regular run nose preppy. Millie, you're all right. Yeah, aside from this lump on my head and the fact that I missed the last 10 minutes of one life to live. You did good, Millie. Watch her while I call downtown. <coughs> well, that was curtains closed for Darlene Boudoir. But who knows, our paths could cross again. Maybe another murder case, maybe a Tupperware party. But until then, I got a rent check to deliver. <laughs> People say happiness will find you, but I think sadness will find you too. It sneaks up on you in darkness. Just when you think you've made it through, it opens holes in what was solid ground. The kind you never know are there until you go to take another step and find you're standing over the air.
Okay. Please. When everything's darkness and you feel so alone, when the rain doesn't stop and you can't make it home, and it feels odd and dark and you just want to run, it can't rain forever. Just wait for the sun. You're standing with pain and friends can't be found and you just want to scream but you can't find the sound but it's all your fault you feel like you're done it can't rain forever just wait for the sun just wait for the sun the sunshine will come the storm only passes it won't last forever the rain only stops and gives way to good weather you're never alone no matter what's done Wait for the sun, just wait for the sun. But clouds always come, I promise you that. They're all waiting with you. Just wait for the sun. I aimlessly walk the hallways that left to my mind, blur voices, a blur of emotions. I follow these voices to the next path. Over and over, I see no end. I want to feel, I don't know how, and there you were. <laughs> Who are you? I didn't know. Why would I care? I was nothing. You were everything. I was closest. Was it okay for me to do this? Like a child, I was scared, scared of what came next. I looked for you, and finally you came. I missed I had never met you. You opened your arms and showed me. I should care. I did care. You tell me every day how much I mean to you. Now it's time for me to say what I know is absolutely true. I know how much you love me, and I know how much you care. You don't always have to say it because you do just by being here. I know you seem to worry every time my mood seems to change, but I want you and you only. No matter how often I act strange, I may not have life figured out, but trust me, that's okay. Because with you, I have the strength to make it through each day. You always know when to hold me down, but you never <laughs> hold me back. I know I fail at tasks a lot, but you always pick up the slack. Don't ever doubt yourself on if what you're doing is right. Just know that I am so thankful to have a man like you in my life. I know I'm not the best when it comes to getting things done, but that's why I have you. And I know that you are the one. You never place excuses for me. You reveal how I do it myself. It reminded me of someone I had met before. It was that little girl stuck behind all those music books picked up the pieces and handed them back to me. It was my turn to put them back together. You showed me I was drowning. And instead of draining the water, you taught me how to swim. You taught me that those engravings tell a story. Do not be ashamed of what they show. They tell a story. My story. I thank you for showing me a life I never knew of. I saw the world differently after that. You showed me. You showed me how to live. No. You did so much more. You taught me how to be alive.
like to have Jury Moore with her persuasive voting rights for Ithaca. America, land of the free and of the heavily incarcerated. According to James Collins from the Brennan Center for Justice, the United States holds 4.25% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. It's ironic that this country runs off the idea that we the people run our government and that the workers, the unwanted and sick, will all be heard and taken into account for. Under every circumstance, Americans are expected to fulfill their moral duty to vote unless they have that right taken away. Unlike many other democracies, the United States disenfranchises its incarcerated citizens. In order to uphold our country's constitution, we need to allow inmates the right to vote. To impress upon you the importance of this topic, we'll first introduce the basics and statistics of prisoner voting rights. We'll then meet the affected populations, and lastly, uncover the role that race takes in prison policy. When prisoners are allowed to vote, America will move past its oppressive tendencies, stop silencing innocent people, and see the true, whole picture of America. First, we'll introduce the basics and statistics of prisoner voting rights. The National Conference of State Legislatures reveals that currently in only two states, prisoners are allowed to vote, Vermont and Maine. In 16 states, felons cannot vote for the length of their sentence, but a period of time after as well. And in Kentucky, Virginia, and Iowa, felons are permanently banned from voting. According to the Sentencing Project, one out of every 50 Americans is disenfranchised barred from voting because of current or past crimes, meaning 5.2 million people in this country are silenced every election. Further, even when ex-felons are allowed to vote, oftentimes they're unaware of their rights and find themselves unknowingly violating their voter restrictions. According to a 2020 PBS article written by Alma Nawaz, 20 people in the state of Florida were arrested for illegal voting despite receiving registration cards from the state. Interviewees report being scared that they will be reincarcerated because of the misinformation that led them to vote in the 2020 election. Let's take a look at Crystal Mason's case. According to an article published by ACLU written by Amrit Chain, Crystal is being interviewed on these counts that the state of Texas plans to send her back to prison for five years for illegal voting. Previously serving three years for tax fraud, Crystal was unaware of the fact that it was illegal for her to vote despite being out of prison. So on November 8, 2016, she made her way to our local election poll. She was told to fill out a provisional ballot with her ID and casted her vote. Six months later, she was arrested with a warrant in her head for illegal voting. Situations like hers aren't uncommon. And in order to rectify the potentially life-altering consequences of voting as an inmate, we need to take a look inside of these flawed systems. Next, after knowing the numbers, we need to see inside of the prisons, inside of the monsters, and see the desperate, the sorrowful, and the misunderstood. Peter Wagner and Wanda Bertram from Prison Policy Initiative reveal that 50% of incarcerated adults are nonviolent offenders. Of all of them, one out of five is being punished for drug-related offenses. But even then, the name violent offender is very misleading because violent offenses include nonviolent drug use, manufacturing methamphetamine, purse snatching, and stealing drugs. Violent offenses don't even necessarily involve physical confrontation to qualify. Further, these types of crimes often stem from poverty and poor education. The National Conference of State Legislatures reveals that 70% of incarcerated adults cannot read past the fourth grade level. This phenomenon stems from a concept called the school to prison pipeline, 
and illustrates a direct link between impoverished students and academic failure. But a lack of education isn't the only issue. With poverty, oftentimes comes homelessness. According to the Corporation of Supportive Housing, 27% of incarcerated adults report experiencing homelessness up to a year before being incarcerated, further proving that currently a significant portion of criminals are being propelled into penitentiaries through poverty. For example, a Boston inmate charged with robbery was given away at birth by his heroin addicted mother, was beaten by multiple male figures in his life, and while being rehomed, witnessed another child being shot in the head. Circumstances like his aren't unique and showcase the very idea that inmates are suffering the consequences of poverty throughout their lives, and prison is just one step on the way. This is who's being barred from voting. Not a bunch of monsters, but oftentimes vulnerable groups of people whose lives and experiences provide valuable insights to policies and ballots. Lastly, we'll uncover the role that race takes in prison policies. The United States has a long history in and out of government of abusing black and marginalized communities. This is still very apparent in our criminal justice system presently. According to a January 1st, 2018 article titled Criminal Drug Issues by Alana Rosenberg, black assistants today are far more likely to be convicted for drug crimes than their white counterparts. 27% of black offenders were convicted, while only 4% of white offenders were. Statistics like this stem from the war on drugs, which heavily criminalized substances and sentenced convicts anywhere from 10 years 20 to life in prison, resulting in the systematic silencing of black voices and imprisonment of anyone whom the government believes is against their plan. John Ehrlichman, Nixon's domestic policy advisor, said in a 1994 interview, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or blacks, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing them both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night in the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. This has a direct translation to the current disenfranchisement of black Americans today. According to the Sentencing Project, one out of 16 black Americans is ineligible to vote today. In states like Alabama, Kentucky, Virginia, Mississippi, and Wyoming, more than one out of every seven black Americans cannot vote. Further, by systematically keeping black Americans in poverty, the government is increasing the chances of black incarceration. According to a January 1st, 2018 article titled Systematic Inequality from the Journal from the Center of American Progress, through a long history of housing and job discrimination, black Americans today are much less likely to pursue higher education, own homes, or occupy stable, good paying jobs, resulting in an endless cycle of poor, uneducated generations. Thus, more poverty-driven crime, more incarceration, and more silencing of voices. To bar inmates from voting is to silence black Americans who have been systematically pushed into prison cells. The right for incarcerated citizens to vote is not a political fight. It is a mandatory right. In order to keep moving forward as a country, we need to allow inmates to vote because silencing one out of every 50 American voices is unacceptable. To support this notion, we first broke down the data and saw the statistics and basics of prisoner voting rights. We then got to know the affected populations and lastly, uncovered the role that race takes in prison policy. Vermont State Senator Bernie Sanders said, I think the right to vote is inherent to our democracy. Yes, even for terrible people, because once you start chipping away, you're running down a slippery slope.
why you're here. You've come here to stare at me, to gape and point and go home with the smug comfort you'll never end up like me. Just as long as the glass is between us. You wouldn't be saying those things if it was just the two of us in a room, palm to palm, with no glass and no idea of what the creature might do. It's a rather frightening idea. You might be scared, flattery, if I ever got as close as to touch you. But that's all I've ever wanted. For her to take my hand and hold it did I get it? No. But I am getting ahead of myself. I was born on the 13th. I've been told often that my mother cried for days after I was born. You see, the doctors could not get me out the normal way, the nice way. So they had to take their pretty knives and cut open her smooth white belly, slashing it down the middle. For years, she used to cry whenever I asked her how I was born. She would say often that if she had known they were going to cut her open, she would have never put a child in the first place. A mother's love is the strongest force on earth. At least it's supposed to be. But sometimes the relationship between mother and child shifts from love to resentment, as in the case of our narrator, in My Mother's Touch by Lauren Levy. A traumatic birth begins their rocky relationship, and a horrific accident writes the ending. My Mother's Touch, Lauren V. Levy. When she was younger, my mother was a pretty thing, the type that construction workers would see and lick their they could just taste the pity honey dripping from her small white fingers. I've never had that trouble. You see, my mother kept all the pretty genes to herself, hoarding them so that when people looked at us side by side, they would wonder what accident caused such a beautiful woman to give birth to such an unsightly being. I only had to take one look at her tiny, pale fingers, and it was mine for never missing. Keep your hands to yourself was what she told me often. The time I remember most, though, was when I was finger painting. I was five years old, and I reached up to my mother for a hug, for warmth. And as soon as my yellow and red painted fingers touched her blouse, she screamed and pushed me away. After that, my mother never touched me again. I was dirty. I would soil her blouse, stain her skin. Sometimes I would annoy her just so she would hold back the cool flat of her palm and slap me. I still remember the cool feel of her skin on my cheeks, stinging a little. Uh, but most of the time, my mother kept her hands to herself. She would shudder whenever she had to take my dry, spidery fingers into hers. This continued for. Until one day, there was a fire. It started.
started innocently in the kitchen where she was cooking. But fires can be tricky things. And soon the whole room rose into smoke. My mother raced out of the house, clutching her apron for fear that the flames, just like my fingers, might dirty her dress. And it never occurred to her that I might still be up there, sleeping peacefully in my room as the flames crept under the door and sucked at my skin. A firefighter pulled me out. But too late, always too late. I'll never forget the feel of the fire against my back like death by a thousand cuts. Only I survived. I think my mother cried when they pulled me out of that house. Because I have survived and she would have to continue to live with this monstrosity. I stayed in the hospital for two months while my skin slowly rotted away underneath the bandages. But instead of becoming numb after the accident, the sensitivity in my fingers increased. And I hungered for a warm palm against mine, a warm body to keep me from falling. But to my mother, I was even more hideous, deformed. My skin resembled a melted candle, my skin hanging off of me like loose parchment. She wouldn't even come near me. My mother sat on the other side of the hospital room as if afraid that my touch might sear her beautiful skin. When we returned home, she hired a woman to change my bandages for her, just so she wouldn't have to touch me. Her child, and touch their charred, dripping skin. I have been a fool to think that she would care, that she would love me. After so many years, I finally became that hideous creature my mother always saw. All that my deformed image haunted her in her sleep. She had so many nightmares after I came back. But when she was sleeping peacefully, my mother was the prettiest thing. She used to lay out on the couch in her best curls after she got home from work. And she would lay so still that you could have sworn she wasn't breathing. But if you got low and you looked close, really close, you'd be able to see her ribcage bump up and down with her shallow breaths like ripples in a lake. That was the only time I could touch her. The only time I could feel her hands in mine and she wouldn't get mad at me. But, but one day, as I sat beside her, and saw that I, the filthy creature that I was, had dared to touch her beautiful skin. So she screamed. My own mother screamed because she couldn't bear the thought of my clumsy, blistered fingers against her milky white skin. And all I could think of was stopping her, stopping her horrible screaming because then maybe she would care. Maybe she would realize that I wasn't such a monster. Maybe she would hold me. And so I panicked, and I did the only thing I could think of, and I, and I took my hands to her swan-like neck, and I picked her to the couch in her best pearls until she stopped. And, and then I, I could hold her for as long as I, 
to smooth skin and mind and not worry about the screaming. But eventually they took her away in a black bag zipped up snug like a cocoon. And when they buried her into the soft wet ground, you could see the blue black silhouette of hands on her neck. Then they took me away, God knows why, uh, to here. It's a, it's a white house like my old one, although the, the walls are padded this time. And my clothes are clean. The floors are clean. And, and for once, I am not just another person. I am like everyone else. People don't look at me weirdly here. And twice in a day, twice a day, once in the morning and, and once before bed, a, a woman comes into the room and she reads the sweetest medicine into my eyes. And she holds me close while doing so. Like a mother feeding her baby. So stare all you want, because I have finally gotten what I've always wanted to be held, to be touched, and to be loved. In Greenville, it's a brand new dawn. With brand new cars and houses and lawns, here in got all that we need, Bill. In Greenville, we manufacture our trees. Each one is made in factories and uses 96 batteries. In Fleetville, the air is not so clean. So we buy it fresh, it comes out a machine. <coughs> in satisfaction guaranteed, Bill, we're happy here in Fleetville. The earth is 
dying. We lose 137 species of plants, animals, and insects every day because of deforestation. By 2030, climate change will be irreversible. But not all hope is lost. Our fearless leader, Sir David Attenborough, once said, this is a story of our changing planet and what we can do to help it thrive. We are Ted Wiggins, Ted's mother, Grammy Norma, the Wunzler, the Lorax, and, and we speak for the trees. Raise your hand if you say let it die. So up, oh, man. Hair. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. The, the Lorax by, by Dr. Seuss. Seuss. With music by John Powell. So, Mom, where could I find a real tree? You tried to have some dirty, messy lump of wood that just sticks out of the ground? Uh -huh. I don't even know what it does. What's its purpose? Look what we've got. It's the uh -huh. Okamatic, the only tree with its own remote. Summer, autumn, winter, and disco! Get into it. Dance with the tree. Mom, please stop. So, let's just say I need a real tree. Where would I go to find one? You need to find the one for her. The what? Ma, it's not really time for one of your magic fables, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. I'm old. It can't even remember to put my keys in. Stand down. That's not what I meant. No, really. I forgot my keys. Would you be up here and go get them for me? Sure, Ma. Okay. Grammy, are we sure this is a real thing we're talking about? Oh, he's real, all right. Well, where can I find him? Far outside of town, where the grass never grows. And the wind smells low and sour when it blows. Ooh. And no birds ever sing except old clothes. Ah! Quit that! That's where the ones live Outside of town? People used to say if you brought him 15 cents, a nail, and the shell of a great, great, great grandfather's nail, he'd tell you everything. Mom, I'm going out to water the sidewalk. I'll be back later. Time for you to go! 
people. Behold, the intruder and his violent ways. Shame on you. For shame. For shame. <laughs> you Whoa. You listen to me, you furry mm. meepo. Oh. I'm going to chop down as many trees as I need. End of story. Then you leave me no choice. If you're not gone by the time the sun sets on this valley, then all the forces of nature will be unleashed upon you and curse you until the end of your days. You have been warned. But I didn't listen to this warning, and you won't believe what happened next. What? If you want to hear more, come back tomorrow. What? Tomorrow? You live in the middle of nowhere. It stinks out here. Please don't make me come back. And I guess you don't really want to hear the rest of the story. No, 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 I do, I do, yeah, I just... you don't have what it takes. Wait, 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 I have what it takes. See here, I'm leaving, I'm walking away now, I'll see you tomorrow. Maybe, just maybe. Hey, Ted, right? Uh, Mr. O'Hare? I hear you've become interested in trees. What's that all about? Where did you hear that? Oh, Teddy, there's not much that goes on in Fenneville that I don't know about. Here's the deal. I make a living selling fresh air to people. Trees, ah, they make it for free. So when I hear people talking about them, I kind of consider it a threat to my business. Come on, man. I don't even know what you're talking Listen about. Listen to me, boy. Don't go poking around in things you don't understand. Everyone can see. 
That's not just a scoop. Any more than you are just a boy. I won't let you down. I know. Dad! What, Mom? <laughs> I'm busy! Theodore Wiggins, you get in here right now, young man, and I'm not kidding with you. Dad, I'd like you to meet Mr. O'Hare, the most powerful man in town. Oh. There he is. Hello, Dad! Hi. Isn't he clever, Mr. O'Hare? He knows his own name and everything. Do you know what I would love right now, Mrs. Wiggins? A delicious cookie. Oh. Great, well, you go get that, Ted, and I'll stay here and talk. Sure. Why don't you just go ahead and adopt him? Mom! <laughs> just kidding, that was a joke. I was joking because I'll just get you a cookie. Listen, I know you have it, Ted, so let's put an end to this. Hand it over. I'm sorry. I don't know what you're talking about. Really? Well, then I guess you wouldn't mind me checking your room! No! What? What's going on in here? This doesn't involve you! Excuse me? I don't care who you are, you crazy little baby man! Get out of my house now! This is outrageous! It's fine, I'm sorry. My apologies, Ted. He'll be sick. Mind telling me what's going on here? Look, Mom, it's the last trophy receipt. And you're gonna help me plant it right in the middle of town, where everyone can see it.